Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Our show is about our relationship with Russia. Some experts have dismissed Russia as a third-rate power, one marginalizing Russia as a Burundi with missiles. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has been seen as a clown who wrestled alligators and rode horses shirtless. But in the 2012 presidential campaign, Mitt Romney prophetically called Russia our number one geopolitical foe. During the last year, Donald Trump appears to have made a number of uncomfortable accommodations toward Putin in an apparent effort to reset our relations. So our question is, what is Russia's game other than to bedevil us on the world stage? Are they friend or foe of the United States? Or maybe just a formidable competitor? With us to discuss these issues is a Russian expert, Thomas Graham. Tom Graham is a managing director of Kissinger Associates and a former member of the staff of the National Security Council. He has recently written a thought-provoking article for Foreign Affairs magazine entitled, Let Russia Be Russia, The Case for a More Pragmatic Approach to Moscow. We're delighted to have Tom Graham here again on the show. So, Tom, a lot of commentators have said 2019 was a great year for Putin. Was it? First of all, Jim, thanks for, for having me. Uh, it was a good year, not a great year. A good year, certainly, in comparison with the turmoil we see in Europe and the United States. Putin established Russia as one of the three major powers on the global stage, along with China and the United States. Uh, he certainly enhanced Russia's uh, strategic alignment with China against the United States. He's playing a dominant role in the Syrian crisis at, uh, at this point, uh, moved Russian troops into the bases that uh, the United States precipitously withdrew from uh, late last year. And in Ukraine, he had, saw the election of a, of a new president uh, who appears to be much more accommodating towards Russia than his predecessor was. All that said, Putin still faces formidable problems, and he didn't achieve some of his major goals in 2019. One of the things he was looking to do was to open up a sustained dialogue with the United States on strategic stability and arms control, a really a top priority uh, for Russia, given its concern about the breakdown in the arms control regime over the past several, uh, past several years. He also wanted to ease sanctions. Uh, the sanctions uh, have not had the a devastating impact on Russia's economy that many in the West had hoped for and anticipated, but they certainly are a drag on the economy, and the economy is stagnating at this point. Uh, so that is a problem for Putin. Uh, and finally, if you look at the situation domestically, Putin still remains by far the most popular figure in Russia, the dominant political figure. But we have seen... It has about a 70 percent popularity level. Rating. Uh, yeah. uh, but, you know, it was 80, 85 percent just a year ago, so it's, um, it's a drastic decline in his popularity. Well, but what Trump would give for a 70 percent popularity Absolutely. rating. A Absolutely. But, you know, socioeconomic discontent uh, is spreading across Russia because of the stagnant con because of stagnant real wages. Uh, it, it doesn't threaten the Kremlin at this point, uh, but it has, uh, has the potential to create some problem for Putin, uh, particularly as he looks forward to 2024 and the next presidential elections. Where do they stand in the world economically? Are they down around Italy, aren't they? Or, or? Well, this depends on how you measure it. Uh, if it's nominal GDP, yes, then uh, down around Italy. If you do it uh, purchasing parity, uh, then it is a around the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. Well, um, while uh, Putin has seen uh, a good year, not a great year, uh, the West has seen uh, a bad year. England has turned on itself with the Brexit. Uh, uh, President uh, Trump is facing impeachment. Uh, and uh, NATO uh, seems to be uh, in decline, having been snubbed by the United States. Uh, and of course, the idea of NATO was to keep Russia out of Europe. Uh, so, I mean, all those uh, factors are probably pretty good for uh, Vladimir Putin. Well, obviously, I mean, Putin foreign policy looks good in comparison to what we've seen happen in Europe and perhaps even in the United States. Uh, all that said, uh, disarray in Europe, disarray in the United States does have its strategic downsides for Russia. Uh, Putin plays up his relationship with China, uh, and he does need to have a good relationship with President Xi, given the size of, that, uh, of, of China, its robust economy, 
uh, the role that it's playing in global affairs. But Putin also needs, over the long term, a strategic counterweight to China. Uh, and the only country that can provide that is the United States. Uh, so at some point, Putin needs to normalize the relationship with the United States for its own strategic interests. But he's also enhanced uh, Russia's relationship with a number of other countries. He's reached out uh, to Israel in the past year, to uh, Saudi Arabia, to Iran, um, and, um, and, and perhaps even to Hungary and Turkey. Um, so uh, he seems to be playing uh, perhaps a bad hand, but playing it uh, masterfully. Well, he is playing a, a weak hand very, uh, very well. But again, part of that is a reflection of the disarray in the, uh, in the West. Russia is playing a larger role in the Middle East, in part because of the daring operation that uh, Putin launched in 2015 in Syria. Uh, but he's also playing a larger role in the Middle East because the United States has been tentative, certainly under the Trump administration, about its role uh, in the Middle East, whether we're going to be further in, uh, engage, whether we want to withdraw from that region. Uh, and countries are looking for counterweights, other partners uh, to work with in a very complicated situation. Russia is one of those. Israel has a very good working relationship with Russia and has had for several years. The Saudis are reaching out, uh, working with Russia and maintaining oil prices. Uh, but all those two countries are also doing that to a certain extent to send a signal to the United States that we have alternatives, that the United States needs to be more engaged if it wants to maintain its own position in the Middle East, and particularly against growing Russian influence. Well, let's talk about the I word, and I don't mean Iraq, I mean Iran. Mm. Uh, there was a strike on Iran, uh, which uh, uh, Russia denounced uh, and said that um, Trump did it uh, really as a distraction from uh, the impeachment proceedings. Uh, so what do you make of all that in Russian terms? Well, first thing that I would point out is that the denunciation was not nearly as sharp as it could have been. Uh, the Russians, like I think everyone else in the world at this point, is concerned about growing turmoil uh, in the Middle East, about the potential for wider conflict, perhaps even a, uh, even a war between the United States and Iran, which would spread uh, throughout the Persian Gulf uh, and into the Middle East. That actually is a, is a real threat to Russia. Uh, Russia has troops in the ground in Syria. How it would manage to stay out of a conflict uh, between uh, the United States and Iran is a big question, something that has to be of concern to, uh, uh, to Putin himself as well as his, as his generals. Well, they have a long-standing interest in Syria. Number one, they oppose regime change everywhere in the world. Uh, while we seem to try to promote it uh, in appropriate cases. Uh, but number two, they have a naval base at Tardis in right. Syria, and uh, they can uh, really take credit for the survival of uh, Assad against his revolution. No, I think that's absolutely true, and those are the reasons, among the reasons, Putin intervened in Syria in 2015. He wanted to prevent re uh, regime change. He wanted to bolster a long-term client of Russia in the Middle East. He wanted access uh, to the Eastern Mediterranean. I think he was also concerned genuinely about terrorism. Uh, a number of uh, Russian speakers, Russian citizens, uh, estimates are in the thousands, went to fight for ISIS uh, in Syria. Uh, Putin was concerned about those people returning to Russia. He was also concerned about uh, terrorists taking over uh, in, in Damascus and what the implications of that would have been for stability in the Middle East and for Russia's interest in Syria in particular. Um, so uh, what has been uh, the policy of the United States uh, in the Middle East, particularly as concerns Russia? I mean, we uh, withdrew forces from Syria. We seem it's been uh, argued that we betrayed our Kurdish allies. Uh, and uh, Russia immediately moved to fill in the void where, where we withdrew. So have they been clever where we were feckless? Well, to a certain extent, that, uh, that is true. We also had somewhat different uh, objectives uh, at the very beginning. The United States was focused uh, clearly on dealing with the, the terrorist challenge uh, in Syria, the Islamic State, uh, to a lesser extent, al-Qaeda. Uh, Russia was focused on supporting Assad. Uh, uh, and we operated in two different theaters uh, in, the, in the initial phases after the Russian intervention. 
uh, we set up a channel to deconflict uh, our uh, our aerial combat uh, in that part of the world, and that channel worked extremely well, and has and continues up to the, today to to work extremely well. Uh, so we're working in different areas, uh, but the United States, I think, hasn't really established a clear strategy not only for Syria but more broadly in the Middle East. Uh, what we want, what our goals are, how we're going to uh, advance uh, stability in that part of the world. And we certainly haven't thought through how we're going to manage our relationship with Russia in the broader Middle East. Uh, well, uh, the Cold War with the Soviet Union ended when in 1991, George H.W. Bush was president. Uh, since then, we've had uh, Clinton, we've had um, uh, George W. Bush, we've had Obama. Uh, we've got Trump. They all tried to reset our relations with Russia, improve our relations with Russia. They all seem to have failed. Uh, why was that? I think the fundamental reason is that there is a yawning gap between American and Russian ambitions and expectations for this relationship. Uh, and that has played itself out over four administrations, uh, whether it's been uh, administrations that wanted to cooperate with Russia, uh, or administrations that wanted to punish Russia. Uh, to put it in sort of the simplest terms, the United States has really been focused on changing Russia, uh, changing its internal regime, changing its worldview, changing the way it thinks about uh, its national interest. Russia, by contrast, has always been focused on regaining its power. If you want a phrase, to make Russia a great power again. Uh, is what Putin has been trying to do over the past 20 years. That's what Peter the Great wanted and, to do. And that's what Peter the Great started. Uh, and in a sense, what Putin wants to go back to uh, is that long tradition of Russia as a great power uh, that plays a large role in global affairs and plays a major role on the continent in Europe. And so to regain its power, uh, what Putin wanted to do, what the Russian political elites wanted to do, was to restore that traditional Russian state. A uh, highly centralized authoritarian state that sees its security in strategic depth, regional hegemony, and tight internal control. So there was a fundamental contrast uh, and divide between what America wanted and what Russia wanted. Uh, and in a sense, because of our ambitions, uh, we were almost doomed to fail in this effort to reset the relationship with Russia. Well, we'd like to see them become a liberal democracy, and uh, they do have elections. Uh, but uh, according to Putin, liberal democracy has outlived its usefulness. He said that. No, he said that in an interview uh, uh, not, not too long ago. Uh, and he certainly believes that. I mean, he sees that as, a, uh, as a, 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 an ideology uh, that had a major impact on global affairs for perhaps a century or more, but is that not uh, adequate to the challenges that he believes the world is facing today, and certainly not adequate to the challenges that one faces in governing Russia. So again, one of the problems that we had was that much of our policy uh, in the first two decades after the breakup of the Soviet Union really was focused on assisting this transition uh, of, of Russia away from a totalitarian communist system to a, a liberal Western dem uh, democracy along American lines. That's not what Russia wanted. That's not Russia's, in Russia's DNA, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and certainly Putin uh, doesn't believe that it is adequate to the challenges he has to uh, deal with in governing Russia uh, and positioning Russia on the global stage. Well, is it fair to say that uh, up until 2008, uh, Putin seemed to be playing along with us? And then in 2008, with the global financial crisis, suddenly he changed his tune. Uh, and that's when he saw us again as a uh, competitor on the world stage. Well, I actually think it begins a little bit earlier. Uh, the, uh, the key year in, in my mind was actually 2004. Uh, and it's booked in uh, by a couple of events that changed Putin's attitude towards the United States and his views of what the United States was up to. Uh, the first event was a major terrorist attack in a, uh, in a small town in the Caucasus. Uh, where a, a small group of terrorists took over a, a, an elementary school and opening uh, on the first school day of the year. Uh, after a standoff of uh, uh, a few days, there was a raid uh, to, to free the hostages. Over 300 people died in that. Uh, Putin 
immediately accused indirectly the United States of supporting the terrorist organization, uh, of using counterterrorism as a shield to undermine Russia uh, in its own backyard. The other event that was important was the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, where the Russian-backed presidential candidate was initially declared the victor in the election, but that was overturned in large part because of demonstrations in, in Kiev itself, but also because of support in Europe and the United States. Uh, and Putin took that as a sign that the United States wasn't really concerned about democracy per se, but it wanted to use democracy promotion, again, as a way of undermining Russia. Uh, so it's at that point that Putin begins uh, or comes to the conclusion that the United States is not really interested in partnership. It's interested in exploiting Russians' vulnerabilities to advance American interest in Russia's strategic backyard, the former Soviet space. 2008, uh, 2009, the financial crisis, I think sort of is the last nail in the coffin. That demonstrates that the economic model that the United States was pushing really didn't work didn't work in the United States. It certainly wasn't going to work in Russia. Now, has Trump changed his approach toward Russia from the approach of his predecessors? Rhetorically, the president has. Uh, I think if you look at the, the actual policy of this administration, the answer is no. It's a continuation uh, very much of the late, uh, late stage of Obama administration policy. That is sanctions, uh, an effort to... Uh, to isolate Russia or to make it difficult for Russia to operate diplomatically in the world. Uh, and certainly uh, that is pressed by the, uh, by the Congress. Uh, it's supported by many senior officials in the administration. Uh, the president himself may have somewhat different view of how to organize relations with Russia, but he hasn't been able to push that through at this point. Uh, well, uh, it could be argued that uh Trump owes his election to the Russians, to their interference in, in the uh, 2016 election. Uh, some have uh, accused him of being a Russian asset, that there's a quid pro quo involved, uh, and uh, that he uh, wants to somehow or other cozy up to Putin. Do you think there's anything in that in, in terms of uh, actually how our policy has played out? To my mind, I very little uh, to that. Uh, Trump won the election for a host of, uh, of reasons. Uh, the Russian interference may have been a factor, but if you pull that out, uh, there's still a, uh, a thousand other reasons why Trump came out on top uh, in the Electoral College. Uh, second, uh, my own read of the situation uh, is that, uh, that the Kremlin and Putin himself uh, didn't particularly expect uh, Trump to be elected president. They were reading the polls that everyone else was. So it was as much a surprise to them uh, as it was to, to people in the United States, and I think to President Trump, uh, to Trump himself. So they hadn't planned uh, for a, a Trump administration. Uh, in many ways, they would have felt more comfortable with the Clinton administration. Yes, it would have been uh, some hostile rhetoric at the beginning, but they basically thought uh, Hillary Clinton was a pragmatist and that eventually she would realize that she needed to deal with Russia uh, as a significant player. Arms control would have been an issue and a host of other uh, matters as well. Uh, so Trump came as a surprise and they've been trying to figure out how to, to work with him to advance their interest vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. And that actually hasn't worked out uh, very well for the Russians up to this point. They haven't had the types of summit meetings, the regular summit meetings that uh, uh, drive progress in the relationship. They haven't been able to establish the continuous talks and arms control that they think it are, uh, are necessary for Russia's own national interests. But um, it's been uh, argued that uh, Trump seems to be acting alone, that he seems to ignore the interagency process uh, for uh, developing a policy, that there really is no policy, that it's feckless, haphazard, incoherent, um, and um, a number of his advisors have resigned. We've had four national security advisors. Uh, so uh, uh, what, can be, uh, what can be inferred from all that? Well, but that's not related to Russia specifically, right? This is a generalized problem that we have in, in the administration. Uh, President Trump is attracted to authoritarian figures. Uh, he claims to want to have a good relationship with Putin, uh, a good relationship with President Xi, good relationship with Kim, uh, a good relationship with Erdogan. Uh, people 
that uh, for many Americans are problematic because of the, the way they conduct their domestic politics, politics and because of what their ambitions are on the global stage. Uh, the fecklessness, the, the lack of the dysfunction in, in policy formulation is something that goes across all issues in the administration. It's not specific to Russia. So again, I would hesitate to, uh, to lay all the, the blame for what we see uh, in Washington on, our, uh, on Russia. It's a, broader, it's a broader issue of administration policy. Now, in the past, we've used, haven't we, a kind of binary approach to Russia, either to reward them for good behavior or to punish them for bad behavior. And uh, one of the ways we punish them is confrontation, sanctions, uh, uh, rhetorical device. Uh, and uh, you're critical of that approach, aren't you? You, uh, you argue that the way forward should be more pragmatic. Why don't you tell us about that? Certainly. Uh, the relationship with Russia, as I've written, is a competitive one. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't cooperate, and that we don't need to cooperate uh, for, uh, for reasons of our own national interest. I put it in the simplest terms. The United States has an interest in preventing the breakout of a nuclear war, something that has guided American foreign policy for the past uh, 50 or 60 years. Uh, we have an interest uh, in restraining competition uh, in geo geopolitical reasons so that they don't spill out of control and create the, the context in which a, a direct military confrontation between the United States and Russia is thinkable, one that could escalate into a nuclear conflict. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the, the current global environment, uh, we have the need to cooperate with Russia, along with other major powers, to deal with a host of international challenges. Uh, international terrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, climate change, pandemic diseases, and so forth. And so what we need to have is not a policy that's focused exclusively uh, on, on competition, on confronting Russia. We need a policy that is a mix of competition and cooperation. Uh, and the question is how we get there. Uh, you know, sanctions can play a limited role if they're within the framework of a broader strategy. Uh, I don't think the sanctions regime at this point uh, fits, that, uh, fits that condition. It seems to be the sole tool of our, uh, of our policy towards Russia. Uh, we need to find a way to engage, to have discussions with Russia on a broad range of issues. Uh, we do that as a matter of prudence uh, because we want to know what Russia is thinking, what its red lines are, so that we don't accidentally slip into a confrontation we don't want. And we also need to have that conversation to see if there are areas where cooperation would be mutually beneficial. Arms control would be a, uh, a primary subject where obviously uh, both sides have an interest in maintaining strategic stability. Uh, and preventing that uh, that nuclear conflict. But we just withdrew from the treaty, um, the arms control treaty. Uh, the, are you supportive of that decision? Well, this is the, the intermediate uh, uh, nuclear yeah. forces in Europe treaty. That is a bit, uh, it's a complicated one. Uh, the way I look at this uh, is that the arms control regime that was built up over the past 40 or 50 years, largely at, uh, as the work of the United States and Russia uh, in many ways has reached its limits. Uh, the environment that we're facing now and into the future is radically different from that. The nuclear equation uh, is rapidly becoming multipolar. Uh, China has a, a significant nuclear force. At this point, it's growing. If we want to reduce our own, own nuclear arsenals, we have to take China into account. Uh, we have advanced conventional weapons that can perform the tasks that once only nuclear weapons could. Cyber uh, weapons are proliferating at this point and also have strategic, uh, strategic, uh, strategic consequences. Uh, and there are many, many countries that can engage in, in cyber, cyber warfare. So the, the arms control environment is much more complicated now than it was before. And in a sense, the INF Treaty out, outlived its purposes. Uh, it banned that, those weapons from the Russian arsenal uh, and the American arsenal, but there are a dozen other countries, or at least uh, 
half a dozen other countries that have those weapons at this point. So we need to think more broadly about arms control and strategic stability in the 21st century. And the question is, how do we get there? Uh, what I argue is that uh, the United States and Russia, because we had this long experience in thinking about strategic stability, thinking about the requirements for arms control, really should take it upon themselves to think through conceptually this very complex problem, uh, try to come to some sort of common understanding of what the requirements are for strategic stability in the 21st century, in the real world environment in which we live, uh, what is the appropriate arms control regime that is adequate to that concept of strategic stability, and then sell that model to other countries in the world, first of all, China. Okay, from your mouth to God's ears. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I have a question for you, Tom Graham. And yes. the question is, are we headed for another Cold War with Russia? And the answer is no. One Cold War was enough. The world has changed. Uh, what we're headed to is a competitive relationship with the Russia, which is actually the historical norm. One Cold War historical norm. Thank you so much for coming by. You're certainly welcome. And thank you for coming by. This has been just wonderful. And uh, tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.